everybody. Welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast, episode 25, where it is our mission to create worlds out of words. I'm Hannah Heath, the multimedia manager for PFW, and I'm joined today by my fellow PFW author, Kyle Robert Schultz, and special guest, Elsa Kindy. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about the ins and outs of good author branding, but first we're going to do introductions. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Hannah Heath. I'm a writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction and the author of The Torn Universe, which is a fantasy and sci-fi expanded universe that contains stories such as The Terebinth Tree Chronicles and Skies of Dripping Gold. Hi, I'm Elsa Kindy. I'm a graphic designer, writer, blogger, word nerd, pun enthusiast, overall artsy fartsy type. <laughs> I'm excited to be here today because branding is something I'm really passionate about. And I'm Kyle Robert Schultz. I am a marketing developer and blogger for Phoenix Fiction Writers. I'm also the author of the Beaumont and Beasley fairy tale fantasy series and the Crockett and Crane Western fantasy series, both of which are set in the same universe. And I am also passionate about branding because pretty much all of my stories are part of the same brand. So I really have a strong interest in how you build a brand successfully. Awesome. All right. So I just have to give a shout out because this is our 25th episode because PFW has been in existence for two years. So this Woo! is, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. Cool. Um, nobody has exploded anything. Nobody's died. I'm so proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> you just today. jinxed it. <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> Hopefully nothing bad happens today. Um, so this is our first episode of our podcast in 2020, and we have awesome things coming this year. Unfortunately, several of them are secret, and we're not talking about them quite yet. Um, <laughs> so just keep your eyes open and your ears open, because we'll be releasing stuff as the year continues. So Elsa, what, what kind of news do you have? Well, I have a merch shop. I do t-shirt designs and tote bags and notebooks and fun things like that. And I, after a holiday break, I'm going to have another set of like maybe three designs coming out sometime this month. So be watching for that. Awesome. And I do have a tank top from her shop and it's amazing. So I recommend everybody go buy <laughs> all the things. <laughs> all right. So I have... Uh, finally, the next book in the Beaumont and Beasley series, the Geppetto Codex, is coming on January 17th, which is a week from today, actually. Oh boy, hope I'm ready. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that has been my, basically my longest awaited book. I think everybody's been yelling at me to actually get that book out instead of probably 12 of the other projects <laughs> that I've been working on over the past <laughs> year. So very happy to finally have that released. Also, and also uh, book six will be coming hopefully shortly after because I'm in totally in finishing mode on the next Beaumont and Beasley books. Also, I recently launched a web comic called Chironicles, which is about mythical characters from mythology doing funny stuff, saying funny stuff, just basically being goofy. Total opposite of everything else I do in the sense <laughs> that there's no continuity or connection to my other work or crazy time travel or anything else. Just me having fun with my limited art skills. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's hilarious. So such a nerd thing to get excited about, but yeah, mythology. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so all of those things are linked below, and actually, by the time this podcast comes out, is the Geppetto, ugh, the Geppetto Codex <laughs> will be out. So go buy it. Cool. It's awesome. I'm excited. I have a book out. I'm so happy. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably actually at this moment freaking out, but I'm just going to pretend that everything's <laughs> fine. Since it's before. <laughs> Good plan. Saucy hair flip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then also J.E. Parazzi uh, on her Discord channel has released the prequel short story to Roanoke, which was her time travel short story in the Strange Waters anthology. And it's amazing. And the short story is amazing, so you guys should go join her Discord and read it, because it's the best. Yeah. 
All right. So story time for this month. What interesting things happened during the month of January? <laughs> well, I don't think I have anything that really happened yet. Lots of stuff is going to be happening, but just as far as in a general boring sense, I feel like with the new year, I'm trying to pull together everything I've learned over the past three years, because basically I have been doing this for three years now, and I'm trying to just learn the lessons that I've been learning the hard way over a very long time, actually put them to use and just start creating a more efficient workflow. So that sounds really boring, but it's kind of <laughs> exciting for me. So that's the time of year for this type of thing, though. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and mine is actually along the same lines, Kyle. So we can be boring together. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm learning um, very slowly how to balance the whole like self care with school and indie author work and research work. Um, I'm one of those people that generally waits until the weekends or the end of the day um, before I do anything relaxing or nice for myself. Um, but I'm realizing that's super unhealthy, especially given the fact that I'm in college. And so weekends and night times don't really exist. You just kind of do work until you die or graduate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good system. Um, so I'm learning that to keep myself from burning out, I have to take a 10 to 20 minute break every two to three hours. Um, even if that's just drinking some tea or taking a bath or watching a bit of Netflix. And it felt super wrong at first because I all in the back of my mind, it was always just, no, you should be working right now. What are you doing? Um, but as I've been doing it more... I've learned that, surprise, it's improved my productivity and boosted the quality of my work. Um, and also, I don't feel like a zombie as much as I usually do. So it's a huge win. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. That's really hard to do. I know working from home, you feel like you have to work all the time. Yeah. It's a struggle. It's hard. It's a hard habit to break. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. My news, well, it's sort of related to my news um i'm pulling together n the new product designs for my shop and um i do literary illusions book quotes wordplay puns it's very much my brand um so i do a lot of research when i'm um, getting ready to design things and it's the same thing as when you're writing you go do research and you kind of go into the rabbit hole and you're and you're you're in research land but the problem when it's merchandise is suddenly you want to buy all of the totes <laughs> and the books and 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 the stickers and the enamel pins and all the things so i'm i'm going to spend more money than i make <laughs> from research it's a problem because it's all so shiny how can you resist <laughs> there are so many good things out there that are book related it's amazing <laughs> well. shout out to everybody on etsy you're amazing it's true <laughs> <laughs> well good luck with that <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> all right so our discussion for this month is the ins and outs of author branding uh now branding is something that kind of freaks a lot of people out um so i thought we should start with the basics which is what exactly is branding because it's this term that people use a lot but don't really know what it means it's like this weird vague thing um so what is branding and why is it important uh well i went really basic and defined define the word uh brand is a marketing term that has to do with your identity it's your logo company name tagline um the word marketing makes a lot of people cringe, but I think branding is something writers could get especially excited about because it takes all of the things that writers are good at. You use your your creativity, your clarity of thought, you objectively look at something, you, you say it the best you can, boil it down to its essence, and then you put a spin on it so it's interesting and it grabs people's attention. Um, that's something writers do every day, but maybe don't think to do that for themselves. So it's a good, it's a good exercise, not just for letting your audience see who you are, but to know who you are for yourself. Yeah, that's very interesting. That, that's a really good point actually about the creative side of it. And I'm, I'm one of these 
weird people that actually enjoys the business side of <laughs> all this whole process. A lot of people Same. really hate. A lot of people really hate it, but I I love it. I just I think it's cool. And um, yeah. So there's there's creativity involved, and I think that what people I think that it's a mistake when indie authors feel like there's a divide between branding and just the writing of, of your books because there really shouldn't be. And if you can't, like you said, take your body of work and then just boil it down to something that, that you, it makes it easy for you to talk about it, to share it with people, to explain it to people. There's actually something wrong that you need to fix in terms of how you are marketing yourself, how your work is tied together. And I mean, if you, you really do have to be thinking about, if you want this to be a successful business, just as much as something that you enjoy creatively, then there should be there shouldn't be so much of a dichotomy between the business and the creative side of things. They should really be going hand in hand. So, mm -hmm. if you feel like you're having a hard time explaining your brand, explaining your marketing, then that is something that you really should sit down and work on. I think in order to tie everything together, because I see branding as what ties your author business, all the different parts of your platform together and establishes it as a business. It marks the distinction between the hobbyist and the professional, which is something that I talk a lot about, but I think it's very important because we really should be seeking to set ourselves up as professionals. So when you commit to a brand, you're committing to a professional identity as an author and defining your own unique brand helps you to figure out what sets you apart from other other writers based on the stories you tell and the unique style you bring to those stories. So if you do it well, branding is really what makes your platform coherent and it keeps you from going down rabbit trails in your business plan, which is so easy to do, especially since, I mean, this is a creative job. So <laughs> I think we all know that we can go down tangents if we're not careful. <laughs> so sure. branding, I think, helps us to kind of just shore everything up, bring it all together and not do that, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always thought of branding as your public and, as Kyle mentioned, your professional face. Uh, it's how people see you as an author. So it's everything from your personality, your writing style, the colors you use, the themes you present in your stories, the way your writing makes people feel, how your, how your website looks. These all should hopefully fit together to create a coherent image of who you are as an author. Um, so, for example, when I think of Elsa, I think of middle grade fiction and bright colors and puns and bookish quotes. Yes. Um, yeah. Success. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then when I think of Kyle, I think of dragons and humor and twists on fairy tales. Um, yes. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so you guys <laughs> nailed the branding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's all because their branding is very concise. Um, and so I think this branding is especially important because it helps your target audience find you. So like, I know I like dragons, so I know I'm going to like Kyle's work and I like bright colors and puns. And so I know I'm going to like Elsa's stuff. Um, and it also <laughs> keeps past readers coming back for more because they know what it is that they can expect from you based off of your brand. And so that helps you build a solid audience because they know that you're not just going to randomly start writing horror when you had been writing like super fluffy middle grade, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So Although we're capable of writing really, you know, absolutely. hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> Death metal fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That will be blood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's a lie. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm super disturbed now. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone already knows that I can go dark, so that's not really a concern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he's got range, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, which brings us to how does an author go about establishing a brand, um, one that's healthy and one that does allow you to express, you know, your full range without, you know, being super crazy or unprofessional? Um, so what are some tips we have for helping people get started on their branding? Well, I think that when you're setting out to build a creative business, the two things that you're trying to bring together are doing something you love and making money, which 
is possible. <laughs> it's not always easy, yes. but that is where successful branding comes in, I would say. It requires you to discover where your passions intersect with something that people want to buy. So for authors, it's figuring out which stories are the ones that we want to write the most and that people want to read the most, and then building a brand with that in mind, kind of what you want and your unique identity and also what the customer wants have to be blended together. So passion and market marketability should go hand in hand without either one getting overly prominent because doing everything exactly the way that you want it might not lead to good branding. You you might have this very specific idea for how you think your brand should look. And I know this from uh, years past when I did uh, web design work for people, a lot of times they would have a very specific idea of how they wanted their business to be presented. And it really didn't work in terms of selling stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, but also at the, on the other hand, if you filter everything you do through other people's opinions, or maybe just through what you see is successful, then you'll end up with something very cookie cutter. So your brand should both appeal to your audience, but also reflect your own unique personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that at least was really intimidating for me at first because I thought like, oh my gosh, how do I even narrow all of this down? Um, so I learned that it's important to ask a ton of questions about yourself and your writing. Um, like who is your target audience? What are common themes in your writing? What are your likes and dislikes? What are your target audience's likes and dislikes? And just keep asking questions. Um, even like what makes your writing and personality different from others? Why would your target audience choose to read you instead of this other person over there? Um, so I used all of these types of questions to figure out how to start shaping my brand. So for instance, um, I knew my target audience was speculative fiction nerds who loved like expanded universes and swords and sorcery. But also because I write young adult, my demographic is younger. Um, which means that because I'm a very fight the, for the cause kind of person and because my <laughs> demographic is younger and also does tend to have that tendency, I knew I could weave in things like um, social awareness and advocacy. But on top of that, my writing style is bold and brutally honest and features all sorts of colorful world building, which came out visually and having very colorful logos and blogs. Um, <laughs> So it's all, it was a lot at first, but then as you keep asking yourself questions and keep honing in, you're going to start seeing these different things pop out at you. Um, but it's definitely a process and I did not figure that all out at once. It took me years. Um, so while it's important to have a definite direction when you start out, you don't have to feel like you have to have it all instantly perfect. Yeah, that's very important. You can't, you have to learn some of that stuff as you go along. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Agreed. I would add to what Kyle said, too, about um, finding that place where it's marketable and that people are going to want it. It's not so much about um, deciding what people want and writing toward that as much as it is look at what you have created and find the things that people are and are going to be attracted to within what Absolutely. you've already done. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just have to figure out how to spin it in a way that's going to get yeah. people's attention. Don't mash things. Yeah, because a lot of times like what, what you sorry. No, yeah, a lot of times that in 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 something that you you have written already, there it'll intersect perfectly with some genre that maybe you didn't even know existed. So you don't have to worry so much about crafting something to market down to the last detail. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise you're really not going to be able to compete very well because there'll be a lot of other people that have exactly the same book essentially. <laughs> That would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, my tip for establishing your brand is um, to think about how your brand is going to be used in real world places. It's helpful to brainstorm what kind of content you actually need and where you're going to use it if you know how you're going to use it. Um, as a graphic designer, I do visual branding work, which is different from branding, but connected. Um, and I love using a style guide um, for everything, like even for writing. Usually a style guide in its truest sense is just like um, 
for designers to know what are the brand colors and fonts and logos. And they look super boring. If you Google them, it's, it's so nerdy, but I love them. <laughs> um, but I, I use them. I put my brand name and my taglines. I put my keywords that I feel that are connected to my brand. I put all the bios and the blurbs for my social media or guest posts or whatever. And I have a lot cause I, have so many different interests so sometimes I need something more related to my writing side versus my you know design side versus my merch shop and I just keep them all in one place so that they're compiled in one style guide and then I can reference that and see visually all the things related to my brand in one place with the colors with the logos and it's very helpful because I'm super visual But that's like compiled over time. Like Hannah said, you just add to it as you go. Yeah. And I wanted to say too, I saw in your notes that you mentioned the style guide. And so I went and Googled them and they're amazing. So (laughs) definitely people go check that out because that's super helpful and cool. And yeah, very nerdy, but awesome. Mood boards for everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's something I really need to do I should probably stop having my drop box look like a tornado hit it and, <laughs> oh yeah I have to find dark logo underscore 47 dash 9 final absolute final file like, for pity's final, sake final 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's like, oh my Relatable. gosh I'm you're calling me terrible out. organization <laughs> terrible organizational skills <laughs> Messy creative tropes here. Yeah. <laughs> most of my, literally, most of my files are in folders like random stuff two, random stuff three. <laughs> okay, yes. it's not random. This is this is my logo for pity's sake. <laughs> uh. Official <laughs> random stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh. the people who are listening, as you can hear, obviously. It's not all clean and perfect behind the scenes. We didn't have this all together when we started. So I know that that freaks people out with branding because it seems so professional and intimidating when you're looking at somebody who already has their stuff together. So just remember, like we're over here scrolling through numerous files trying to figure out which one is our logo. So it's fine. (laughs) You'll get there. (laughs) Why are you calling me out? (laughs) Well, I do that too. I'm like, this is the final one, I swear. And I'm like, no, that's no nope. final one, I swear. 2.0. I'm like, okay, well, all right. Fact. <laughs> so there's obviously a lot to branding, um, and it can be hard to keep track of. So what are some seemingly tiny but very important aspects to branding that authors should be sure to remember? Remember who you are. <laughs> Um, Moana. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't edit that out. <laughs> um, my piece of advice is mind your manners. Um, what you do and say online impacts your reputation. Um, you your behavior online and what you say, what you do, what you post is just as important to your branding as the blurbs and the graphics you make. Um, I'm not saying you have to keep your social media strictly professional and it's only all business stuff and ads and all this stuff, but like not every minute, not every moment, not every opinion has to be something that you share to be authentic or real or relatable. So maybe just filter what you're thinking, maybe write it down on the side. And if it still seems relevant two days later, go ahead and post it. But think about what you're doing for your brand, not just with your graphics and and your content, but also with how you're behaving personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so important, especially when you first get on social media, first get a blog, everything's new and shiny. Um, (laughs) And it's so hard to stay on track. So for me, I have to remember that everything I post should be somehow related to who I am as a brand and author and where it is that I'm wanting to go with my career. Um, So before I post anything, I ask myself, like, well, is this related to either of those two things? And if the answer is no, then probably don't post it. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but it doesn't have to be super restrictive. So like, for instance, if it's something harmless and interesting, like, oh my gosh, I just saw a picture of a baby armadillo. Look at this. <laughs> uh, like, that's fine. It's off brand maybe, but it's not going to hurt anyone or yourself in the long run. Um, so you don't have to be overly restricting right. yourself about your posting habits. Just be very intentional about what you're posting and kind. So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I love what you said, Elza, about instead of just tweeting something or putting it out there like right away, write, write it down and mm -hmm. let it sit for a bit. Because, you know, I've I've definitely learned that, you know, now and then when I've made myself do that, I realized actually I don't have to put this out there. And it's not it's not that it's ever really anything controversial, but it's more that it would have been a waste of time. I mean, you know, everything that you put out there it's something that you then have to deal with and that takes up a certain amount of your time, both posting it and then maybe responding to replies on it and that kind of thing. It's, it's all, mm -hmm. it all chips away at the time that you have. And if all of your time is taken up with managing your online presence, then you're not going to be able to be creative. Yeah. And you, I know, and also uh, tying in with what I said before and with what, both of you were just saying it does have to be coherent. So, you know, your your identity that you have, your brand identity online, it's not that it's fake, but it does represent maybe more of a specific part of who you are, not necessarily all of who you mm -hmm. are. Yeah. So your your whole daily life, daily routine isn't necessarily going to be on there. And really, I would say it shouldn't be on there. I would say that this what you do online as part of your brand identity should be just all about that, all about you as a writer in this particular case. As far as the other stuff, you know, if it's something you enjoy sharing personal stuff or more 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 personal stuff on social media, maybe that should be limited to a certain account or a different account or just some other place online that's not necessarily your your business. Um, and then another thing I would add that's totally different from, <laughs> not really totally different, but not quite the same, it's more technical, is uh, to claim your name. And this is something that I did recently with actually starting my webcomic because I wanted it to be a little bit separate from the rest of my brand. It's not that it clashes with my brand, but it's kind of its own thing. It's not writing, it's a comic. So um, I took everything that I had learned from building my author business that I kind of learned the hard way by having a very messy brand in the beginning <laughs> and tried to make a very coherent brand right from the beginning. So I took the Chironicles name and got it on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, just making sure I got all of those names and parked something there and sort of started all of those, launched them all at the same time mm -hmm. instead of waiting to see whether it was going to take off before I did that. And I mean, it hasn't like taken off. I've only had it for like three weeks, <laughs> but <laughs> still it could. So it's but taken off in our hearts, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the machinery is in place. So that's kind of cool. You know, I have the Patreon, I have the Facebook page, I have the Instagram. And I do wish that I had done that a little bit more coherently with my Kyle Robert Schultz author name from the beginning. It would have saved me a few headaches in the long run. Mm. So it, I definitely, I think part of that is you have to have the confidence to think of it as a business and as a real professional brand right from the beginning. So claim your name. That I would say is very important. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know I also did not do that. And so, you know, you'll go on my social medias and see that all of my, my handles are slightly different from Instagram <laughs> to Facebook and Twitter. And I don't think anybody really minds but it drives me insane every time I look at it. <laughs> it helps at least you have the same profile picture on all of them so at least you're like oh, okay it is her. That's true yeah which is actually my next point was that uh, it's really important to show off your logo and uh, your profile picture and your tagline if you have one every single chance that you get so you should be using them across all of your platforms. They should be the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> put them on your social media headers, on your websites, in your email signatures. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it does ensure that you are very visible. And 
like not to sound too creepy, but it's kind of like subliminal marketing. And so it like <laughs> burns things into people's minds, uh, which ends up being helpful. So mm-hmm. I don't find that creepy at all. Ah, right. I don't know what that says. I don't know what that says about me, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Go Slytherins. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> I'm turning you all. <laughs> My Ravenclaw part of me is so disturbed right now. <laughs> Slitherclaw, come on. It's true, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, something that we've all kind of touched on a little bit is that uh, sometimes and oftentimes, actually, people's styles shift over time especially when you start out not really knowing how to brand. Um, You know, maybe they start writing outside of the genre they originally built their brand around. Um, So how can authors deal with rebranding in a healthy and professional way? I would say that depends on the context to some degree. It it depends on why you're rebranding. So if your original brand never really got off the ground and it needs to be fixed. If you just, you try to start a brand and it just didn't go anywhere for some reason, maybe your marketing wasn't right or you didn't have a coherent brand or you weren't going for a niche that really had a, a strong audience, then I would say it's fairly simple. I would just make the necessary changes to improve it and start over from scratch, just reboot the whole thing. On the other hand, if you do have a successful brand, or at least even a moderately successful brand, but your interests have changed, then you have to make a decision. You have to decide if you want to expand your current brand to include your new interests or leave that brand untouched and start up a side hustle under a pen name. Uh, If you want to write in a genre that's very different from what you have now, then a pen name is the best option for a number of reasons. But if it's not too different, then think of ways that you can build on the foundation that you already have. For example, um, I am eventually going to be working, uh, I would say, science fantasy, not really science fiction, but science fantasy and superhero stuff into my existing brand over time. But I'm not going to bother doing a pen name for those things because they're still going to be the same basic style as the rest of my work, even though they're not exactly the same genre. I'm just going to include them under the same umbrella of the Kyle Robert Schultz brand. Uh, the only the only complicated thing with that is that all of my stories so far have been in the same universe. And I don't see that as I'm a problem. I don't confuse anybody because the, the same tone Yeah, the tone is going to be the same. It's still going to be very much Mm -hmm. a Kyle Robert Schultz book. So that doesn't really matter. So, but if I were going to do something else like horror, which I'm not, but just say that I were, then I would definitely want to consider, okay, do I want to have this be under my name or not? Probably not, because that would clash very much with the rest of what I've written to some degree, even though there's some creepy stuff here and there. But there's two reasons for that, though. For one thing, you don't want to throw off the fans that you have. And for another, there's a more techie side to it. When you are selling books on Amazon and you're trying to do well in certain categories on Amazon, if the also bought section is a mixture of different books, that doesn't work very well. The Amazon algorithm gets confused and then your sales in general go down. If you're if you're if somebody who has bought one kind of book from you then goes out and buys a very different kind of book and that shows up in your also bots that can make your it can make amazon confused about who they should be recommending your books to and what you're trying to do is train amazon to sell your books for you and you're not going to be able to do that if amazon is just really mixed up about who wants your books so (laughs) yeah basically if you're going super different then consider a pen name if not just try to keep everything under the same name if possible, I would say. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think if you are not doing the pen name routes, like if the change isn't that dramatic, but still pretty dramatic, basically you have two options. You can do a slow shift um, where you don't do it all at once and you just kind of take your time and it's more subtle, or you make it into this massive rebranding event. Um, so this event route takes more work, definitely, and it's 
basically for when you've realized that you have made a huge mistake and need to <laughs> do a fairly large course correction. Um, so it involves blog posts. I've seen some people do giveaways, um, website grand reopenings or website launchings if you didn't have one to begin with, uh, mm. social media announcements, etc. cetera. Um, it's a lot, but it does draw more attention and positive attention which is what you're uh going for because you it's a negative situation you don't ever really want to be in this position but you are and so this is a way to take it and use it to your advantage um but if you're gonna do a slower shift where maybe you just have to change around some colors or the fonts that you're using basically if you're switching your style guide as we've learned from Elsa, <laughs> um, nerd stuff yeah <laughs> um, it, it, this isn't a big change and so it's something that you can kind of work at uh, over the course of a few weeks and just kind of do it subtly um, and you don't even really have to announce it and then people will come on and be like oh cool this looks pretty and then you know everybody moves on with their lives and you haven't hurt yourself <laughs> so <laughs> and you know if something doesn't work you know if you try something new and it just doesn't land you can try again with something else. I, I tried uh, my previous tagline for a while was clean content, perilous tales, which I thought would work. And you know, it didn't because nobody really cared about the clean content side of it. it there, it's, my books are still clean, but marketing to that audience just didn't work. So I just changed it to my current magic monsters and multiverses, which was much more popular. Mm. And you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a huge misstep. I just moved on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Taglines are so easy to change. And honestly, I don't think anybody notices unless you point it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, I like your tagline. I'm like, you saw my tagline? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> this is coming from the That's girl who so doesn't true. read chapter titles. So <laughs> <laughs> hi, guys. <laughs> That's a bad bookworm moment right there. Back to my blog post <laughs> i'm a bad bookworm i don't read chapter titles <laughs> I actually... and i work so hard on my chapter titles i'm so sorry my mom does too she writes and and she gets mad at me when there's um a typo in the chapter title because i won't see it <laughs> well i'm yeah. just now realizing as soon as you said that i don't read them either and i didn't even realize that about myself until just now so Another thing in common. Yeah, we can go to bookworm <laughs> jail together. Yay. <laughs> we play too much D&D. &D. It's true. Well, yeah. I'll tell you, I, I, didn't, I, I thought that nobody read chapter titles initially, and I had all these clever, funny chapter titles, and I thought, you know what? Nobody cares about these, and I stopped doing it, and then somebody emailed me oh, and was no. like, why did you stop doing that? That was so fun. So I had to go, I eventually went back and changed them to make them funnier, because I was like, there were some people that were reading them. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. There are people who read them. I'm just not one of them. Sorry. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't think any less of you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I would add to what they've said about rebranding is that um, you can avoid reaching that full blown rebrand phase. <clears throat> if you keep your brand more flexible, um, ideally I like the idea of focusing the brand on yourself rather than hyper specifically on what you write. Cause even if you're totally locked in as a genre writer, it's really very normal for creative people to morph into different styles, different themes, different interests. So even though what you're writing is, pretty much the same it, it does evolve um i wouldn't recommend theming things to your first book your first publication um is not the best indication of what you're going to be doing as a writer forever and ever and ever even though it maybe feels that way um i'm willing to bet that your next series or novel is going to have a totally different feel than your first publication so it's my opinion that if everything is themed to your first book you're basically painting yourself into a corner um but that's an opinion that's not necessarily true um big companies um actually 
um, are a good example of how um, your identity is more on you than on what you're creating. Um, I like to think of Geico because I'm a weirdo and I like commercials. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But Geico is really fun. They have the did you know commercials. They have the one where the um, gecko dude goes around the United States. They did those so easy a caveman can do it once way back in the day. <laughs> I miss I feel those. Old. I like those ones. <laughs> those were the best. Um, they're all very different, but they are recognizable as Geico material because the campaign is branded um, with the same satirical humor. Um, and writers basically do the same thing as those companies. You're creating... Um, content you're creating books you're creating things um, that are under your your author self what you write what you do as a creative person Um, the added benefit with the writer is you don't have to come up with a commercial campaign you write the books so that dictates (laughs) a lot of what you do Um, so in short um allowing your brand to evolve with you and take on different forms and leaving it the space to, to maybe not be as solid. This is my brand, but more like I am my brand. Um, that way you don't outgrow your brand and run into those problems of, of, um, needing to totally redo everything because you locked yourself in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that is very true. I know when I was start, starting out, I was researching on really what my website domain name should be. And it seemed like there was a decision between you could either make it about the books or about your, your name or just have it be your name. And mm-hmm. I'm really glad that I went with the name because, I mean, I do own a couple of domain names for my books just for the intellectual property. I own... Uh, uh, Beaumont and Beasley.com, Crockett and Crane.com, et cetera. But I may not actually use them just like, you know, if I ever become a billionaire and <laughs> <laughs> that way nobody else can come along and buy them. But Smart. yeah, so, <laughs> but yeah, I, I totally agree with you because it's more about, it should be about you. And that does give you the flexibility to, to branch out and absolutely, absolutely agree. It should not be centered around the first thing that you write because you may move far beyond that someday. And then that way you're not limited. That's yeah. very, very. What if your sixth publication is the one you get to be a millionaire on exactly. and you're locked in on exactly. number one over there. Nobody knows what number one is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that happens to a lot of authors. If you look at a lot of people that are really famous for one book or another right now, you look at their back catalog and say, oh, they wrote this or such and so. And you don't really know anything about it because that that never became as popular. Maybe it wasn't as good. And so if they had bound themselves to that book, that would not be as convenient for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other added bonus of branding yourself is that it really helps your search engine results. Because as you move forward, you're going to have a lot of book titles and uh, people aren't really going to be able to remember all of them, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) But if they can pop your name into Google and your website comes up and your books come up, then that's great. And that's going to be really helpful in the long run. Mm hmm. Name the pathetic thing is when you're so disorganized that you have to Google yourself to find pages on your own website in order to look things up. Oh, I do that on a daily <laughs> which is, basis. Which is my problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'll start writing a blog post and be like, did I do this already? I'm going to Google it. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. I'm going to get to that point one of these days. My blog's still too new for that but (laughs) I can see it already it's chaotic (laughs) but it's fun all right so what are some common pitfalls when it comes to branding and how can we avoid these issues um my first one is mistaking professionalism with being impersonal and distanced from your readers um professionalism is actually sort of the opposite um you want personal connection it's super important to um have your brand feel like an individual not some big conglomerate thing you know (laughs) and it's it's impossible to manufacture personal connection so that's an important part um 
of branding that you want to keep intact. Um, my second thing is a little bit of a pet peeve. It's a little bit opinion-y, but um, posting the first draft graphics or the first draft copy material that you write. Like you just pulled up Twitter and I'm going to write a quick blurb right here in Twitter without thinking about it. Um, or I'm going to make a graphic real quick in 20 minutes and then post it. And it's like, um, maybe not do that because that's the first draft. Like, especially if it's the first graphic you've ever made, don't, don't post your first draft, <laughs> sit on it, like look back at it, maybe edit it if it needs it. It's okay if it doesn't, but like sit on it a little bit, think about it before you post it. Cause you do that with your books. So just apply that, that same concept of, um, you know, giving it an editing pass before you post it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm like perfectionist, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, relying on being a writer as your personality or identity. Um, it works. And being a writer is definitely relatable, but it's only relatable to other writers. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of a niche. So you want to be careful while you are a writer and that is interesting. It's not that interesting. Come on. We're all writers. <laughs> It's not that interesting. I'm sorry. So, so rude. Like, just be a balanced person. You know, Offense. have have some hobbies. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's not a personality. It's just one side of you. Branch out, people. <laughs> oh, and I'm going to have no friends after this. <laughs> and then uh, my last one, super opinionated. All right. <laughs> last last shot fired um phoning it in because somebody told you you had to quote do branding uh if you're not like committed to do branding um don't do it because it's better to just go with what you're doing than to do branding badly because if you if you run into somebody and you can tell that they just did the branding real quick because they had to and they didn't they didn't put any actual like time or effort or energy or, or skill into it. It, it really screams. This was a low priority to me. I didn't want to do it. And that, and that doesn't, you know, evoke any confidence in the professionalism at best at worst. It's like, um, Hmm. <laughs> Do you know what you're doing at all? You know. Yeah, absolutely. That was opinion -y. <laughs> No, that's... <laughs> that might need to be edited. <laughs> Never. This is always my favorite part of the podcast is pitfalls because this is where everybody has all of their opinions and it's great. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. I'm going to lose friends. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I agree, actually. Um, because trying... Uh, when you're phoning it in or even just trying to do it all yourself when you're not good at it it's just a really bad idea um like I'll use myself as an example my original logo I did myself I don't know how to design a logo um it wasn't terrible but it was not good <laughs> either <laughs> it was just in that kind of blah range um <laughs> So later on, I did end up hiring somebody to do it for me, um, and I wish that I'd done that from the start because it was so much better and so much more cohesive and just more obviously part of my brand. Um, and so that's kind of when I learned if you're not good at something or even if you don't have the time, like it's fine to hire somebody. I think as, an indie, auth as indie authors, we always think we have to do everything ourselves, um, mm -hmm. but that's not true. Um, so if you don't have a natural sense of branding or like Elsa mentioned, you just don't want to do it, um, <laughs> you need to hire somebody or at least consult multiple people while you're building your brand. Um, because otherwise it will go wrong and you're going to have to rebrand and that's not fun. So, Yeah, well, since Elsa broke the ice by being opinion-y, I'll just push it <laughs> even further. No, actually, I want to say I, I do absolutely agree. Uh, I want to. I just wanted to say I absolutely agree on the posting unfinished material. I think mm -hmm. is not not a good idea, and I say that as someone who used to do it all the time. And I think 
the reason why we're tempted to do that, especially early in our careers, is because we're trying to force ourselves to get it done. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way of doing that is by putting it online. Then, okay, I feel like I have a commitment now to get this done, which, okay, fine. Maybe that works for your NaNoWriMo project, but your your writing career is not going to be a perpetual NaNoWriMo. It's not how it works. Mm -hmm. You have to actually learn how to commit to a project of your own accord, get it done instead of relying on a, a vast network of accountability partners to push you along. Because those people out there are supposed to be your customers and they think of themselves as your customers, not your writing buddies, basically. Mm -hmm. That you shouldn't just have a big network of writing buddies. And um I also agree about relying on being a writer as your as your identity and, and the the whole thing about you just talking to other writers. And that's an easy trap to fall into, especially especially on Twitter, I would oh, say, yeah, because sure. author Twitter is a very entertaining place and, you know, you can spend a lot of time there and have a great time, but then you will eventually realize you're not selling any books because you're just talking to other writers and it becomes this sort of echo chamber mm -hmm. that wastes a lot of your time and doesn't actually, and you think you're accomplishing something, but you're actually not. Uh, I mean, granted, I do interact with other writers a lot, mostly on Discord, I would say at this point, in a more much more private setting uh, where, you know, I'm doing sprints and stuff like that, which of course that's, that's very helpful, but there it's all about productivity and it's not about, putting your entire process out in public, which ties mm -hmm. into one thing that I would say, which, and this is also probably going to lose me friends now, but <laughs> I think that it's a good idea to apply the famous quote from British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, which was, never complain, never explain, when you are a writer, mm -hmm. uh, which that may not sit well with everybody, but you know, I don't think it's a great idea to always make something that you perceive as a failure a big public thing that you go on and on about because mm -hmm. that can put a dent in your professionalism and also a lot of people may not care about it nearly as much as you do because they are not writers and so something that you're having like a draft that you're having a really hard time with or a story that maybe you had to scrap and pick something else or whatever you know if you talk about that a lot online that is something that for one thing it's really going to only be relatable to other authors mm -hmm. and it's also it just comes across as making you seem a lot less professional. I, I'm I'm not saying, I mean, if it's something that you really are struggling with or if you're going through a hard time or something, that's kind of a whole different category. But, and that's actually kind of the point. It is a whole different category. If it's some personal issue that you're dealing with that you, you need support with, that's not part of your brand. That's not a part of your professional brand. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be in its own category. I'm not saying it shouldn't be online. I'm just saying it maybe shouldn't be on the part of the internet where you are sharing your business related things. Mm -hmm. And I also would say that you, one of the biggest mistakes you can make when you are seeking to do any kind of branding is not committing to being a career author early on. I said this before, but don't wait to do that. It's very hard to shift from hobby mode into professional author mode. And hobby mode, I would say, includes uh, spending a lot of time on something like author Twitter and just talking a lot about the process, talking about creating your stories. That is, you're very much in the hobby mindset when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you are establishing your online persona as a hobbyist. And see, that's the trouble because if a potential customer looks at your Facebook page or your Twitter or whatever, and they see a lot of hobby-related stuff, they will be more inclined to interpret that as, oh, this person is just a hobbyist. I'm not sure if they'll ever get their book finished. I'm not really going to take much of an interest in what they're sharing about their book because I'm not sure I can trust them to produce the product that I'm looking for. Because Believe me, they've seen a lot of people share a lot of cool stuff online mm -hmm. that they have never actually finished because that happens all the time. So yeah. you want to set yourself apart from that and your branding will be a lot easier to manage if you confidently embrace your identity as a professional author from the start. Then you won't have this very difficult shift where you have to go back and weed out all the hobby stuff from your, your <laughs> platforms and say, hey, I'm actually a professional now. It, it, you don't want to have that happen all at once and then be faced with that 
big job at the last minute. You should really be promoting yourself as a professional as quickly as possible, as much as possible right now, even if your book's not finished. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. I think a good rule of thumb for that is to ask yourself, could you behave this way in any other profession and still succeed? Um, Mm. So like, for instance, Kyle, you'd mentioned being confident, which is something I see a lot on online with authors and writers is they'll kind of put themselves down a lot. So if you take, well, I'm taking a food service operations class this quarter, so I'll use this as an example. Like if you went to a restaurant and the chef was like, yeah, I made this, but like I wasn't feeling great when I did and it's not the best, And but did you want to pay me to eat it? And I'd be like, nah, bro, like I'm going to go somewhere else. What are you talking about? Did you sneeze in that? Right. What? <laughs> like, now I don't trust you. I don't think this is going to be any good. Why would I not just go across the street to the other restaurant? So it, just ask yourself, could you do this in any other industry? And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't be doing it in this industry either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a brilliant analogy for, for that. And, and I mean, yeah, of course, imposter syndrome, we talk about it all the time. We writers, we mm-hmm. do all suffer from it, but that should not, even though it's a very relatable common struggle for our group, it should not bleed into your marketing, certainly to any degree or how you're presenting your books, because actually, when you think about it on the flip side, the people who are just your readers, maybe they'd never even heard of imposter syndrome. And, mm-hmm. you know, you start talking about this issue and, and yeah, another writer might look at something you've said and say, oh, you know, I understand how, where they're coming from, but your readers won't necessarily feel that way. And as you said, Hannah, if you are expressing a lack of confidence in your work, that's not going to help you compete with other people who maybe are in a traditional career and they don't even have the option of not being confident about their work because their contract <laughs> doesn't even let them tweet about oh, this was this book was a real pain to write. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. So in an attempt to keep us from losing any more friends, I'm gonna. And this on a positive note, hopefully. Woo! Yeah. Um, So I think, (laughs) but I'm still talking about pitfalls. So let's see if I can spin this. So (laughs) let me try. We're very positive people, I promise. Yes, we just want you to succeed. Um, I think uh, one of the issues I see with branding is when people just aren't themselves. Uh, So many writers try to mimic other authors' branding. Um, because they'll look to somebody who's successful because that's what we're taught to do we're taught to go and study other people and then go off of that but then people often take it too far and they end up trying to be this other brand that they're not and it's tiring and it's kind of soul killing and it can make you look fake but none of those things are good obviously um so branding is so much more so much easier and so much more fun and so much more authentic when you center it around your personality as we mentioned earlier and what it is that you enjoy um so Mm -hmm. not other people not even necessarily solely what your target audience enjoys it should still be centered around you and I know that sounds really like self-centered and who cares about other people I'm gonna be me but it is kind of a good way to start off with your brand because it makes sure that you're moving in a direction that you're going to be happy with as you continue along this path Mm -hmm. yeah so (laughs) We all like <laughs> dragons and sarcasm and puns. Come on. <laughs> These are relatable things. It's true. So Well, yeah, in many in many cases you are your own target reader. So This is true. Know. Exactly. <laughs> I am a 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's maybe it's not fact. applicable across the board, but oh. <laughs> Hannah knows. I am 12. It's true. She is. So. <laughs> but 12-year-olds are awesome, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. So that's branding, everybody. Um, we are going to move on to book club. So, Kyle, what, what are you reading this month? I have not been reading much lately unfortunately <laughs> i uh i've been working hard on catching up on projects so my reading has really fallen by the wayside but i have been reading i have actually been catching up on the 13th doctor comic from doctor who uh which is actually very good uh right now they're moving into a 
crossover story where the 13th Doctor meets the 10th Doctor, which is pretty cool. Mm. And uh, I've been doing that because so far lately, Doctor Who has actually been better. Fingers crossed that it stays that way. So that has been my only reading, unfortunately, but it still counts. So <laughs> <laughs> that totally counts. <laughs> uh, I've been reading um, middle grade fiction, of course. Um, I just finished today um, The Best at It by Malik Panchali. And it's a realistic fiction about a boy whose parents were from India. So he's like first generation um, Indian American. It's got a lot going on in it, which was very exciting for me. Lots of different issues, lots of different topics like bullying and uh the character had some compulsion type things i think ocd but um that was really good and very i liked the characters a lot they were very fleshed out and then i just started today barely um the magic misfits by neil patrick harris so that's i'm very excited to read that that's been on my shelf for a while um but that's fun. That's part of my challenge this month. I'm trying to read five books for um, a challenge. Start on your shelf a thon. It's really fun, and I'm earning stars for reading books that I already <laughs> own and haven't read. So, <laughs> no, I told you I'm 12. <laughs> I want the stars. <laughs> yes. If I can manage to get a book bingo at the same time, I'll feel very good about myself. So. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I have been listening on audiobook to The Chilling Effect, or actually there's no the, just called Chilling Effect by Valerie Valvis, and I can't remember the narrator's name, but she's great. Um, and it's just like this hilarious Mexican-inspired space opera thing, and it's just been a fun romp, so I like it. Um, and then also, uh, I've been... So th this professor... I meet with on a regular basis is consistently four minutes late to all of our meetings, like exactly four <laughs> oh, minutes. No. So that's not a lot of time to do anything really, but I did realize that about four minutes is what it takes to read one or two chapters from Dear Author by Laura A. Grace. Um, and for anybody who's not familiar, it's this book that's these short letters two authors by a fangirl which is laura a grace and it's just super encouraging and funny and uplifting and i love it and it's Aww. really a great way to spend any of your spare moments that you have so i recommend it that sounds sweet yeah it's great yeah i have that one but i haven't read it yet i'm looking forward to it it's really good <laughs> yeah so that is it for our podcast um well, the End of the first podcast of 2020. So, Ooh. <laughs> the one that lost the one that lost us all our friends. Yes, <laughs> great <laughs> way to start. Nobody died the year. and nothing's on fire. That's true. <laughs> they have each other That's in a true. raft. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, <laughs> we've dug ourselves in too deep. Can't go back now. We're pariahs. Fun <laughs> job. Be likable. <laughs> <laughs> Likeable, shlikeable. <laughs> uh, so if we have not lost your friendship, please stop by our website at phoenixfictionwriters.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at phoenix underscore fiction, on Instagram at PFW Books, and also on Facebook. You can find us on iTunes and YouTube and Google Play and Spotify. Um, yeah, so subscribe, like. Uh, leave us a comment. We're always excited to hear from you. Uh, you can find me personally on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website at hannahheathwriter.com. Elsa, where can we find and follow you? All right. I am on Twitter and Instagram at Elza Kindy, E-L-Z-A-K-I-N-D-E. -E. Um, and then my website, elzakindy.com. And if you want to check out my literary-themed merchandise, that is at bumblebest.com. 
And I am on Twitter at Kyle R B R T Schultz S H U L T Z no C in Schultz. And for every other site, you can find me by plugging in Kyle Robert Schultz. Just make sure there's no C in it, and I will come up. And my website is KyleRobertSchultz.com. And also, since we're talking about branding, you can also look at the website and brand I've created for my webcomic at Chironicles.com. Yes. Ooh. Ouch. So- all of those things are linked below, so be sure to visit them. Um, also, especially go give a shout out to Elsa Kindy. Um, thank you, Elsa, <laughs> for coming on and chatting. It was great. Thank you for having me. Yes. It's been fun. You get all the gold stars. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so that's it for this month. Next month, in the month of February, our podcast will be with Beth Wangler and E.B. Dawson, and we're going to be talking about Disney animated films specifically the Disney animated films that influence us as writers and the lessons that they taught us and what you also can learn from them. So it's going to be really nerdy and really fun. So you should tune in. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And yeah, that's it. So if you have comments about branding or want to tell us about your favorite brands so we can go and learn from them, or if you want to send Elsa style guides, go ahead and do that. We're (laughs) always happy to talk with you. Uh, Yeah. So thank you, Elsa and Kyle, for coming on. It was great. Thank you. It was. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.